Fading Kingdoms, Part 3, The Garden, written and narrated by Daniel Myers. Chapter 7, The Trial. We have to go. He's lost it. You've made the right choice. Durand violently awakes from a deep sleep, rolling off his bed onto the floor. He is unable to catch his breath. It takes him a minute to control his breathing. Eventually, he climbs back onto the bed and throws his head into a pillow. I made the right choice. I made the right choice. An enlightened walks into his quarters. Morning, my fellow enlightened. Your presence is required in the square. I haven't slept so well. Is it really necessary that I... It's necessary that you not ask unnecessary questions. They are expecting you. Okay, Uh, understood. Thank you then. I'll be there in a minute. Best not to keep them waiting. Right. He exits his quarters and makes his way to the village center, just days after the scuffle between the Enlightened and his former companions. Some Enlightened are still repairing the front gates set ablaze during the intrusion. This way, please. Duran feels the gaze of many enlightened. He still feels somewhat uneasy in their presence. As he turns the corner, he is greeted by the head enlightened, who recently revealed herself to be his grandmother. Hello. You look wonderful in your robe. In fact, we all do. Thanks for joining us on this beautiful morning. My pleasure. But may we have a word in private? I... We have gathered here this morning for our tradition of initiation. A new member wishes to join our unique village. But first, this person, an individual formerly known as Durand Wellington, must face the trial. Trial? I'm confused. What do I need to stay on trial for? For everything, my dear. I'm certainly not perfect, but I dare say I've lived a fairly noble life. Uh, Let's not forget why I'm even here, you know, why I set out in the- We must delve into your deepest, darkest secrets into your past. In order to continue our utopia, to maintain and grow this sanctuary we have created, we must not take any chances by allowing spoiled citizens into our ranks. In order to join us, you must air out every sin you have committed, no matter your age when the sin was committed. For us to remain perfect, we have to acknowledge our imperfections. This is the proper way to both purity of heart and mind. The crowd of Enlightened nod emphatically while staring up at their leader. Well, I suppose I could confess to my past wrongdoings, as, you know, I am human after all, yet I I don't know why my childhood missteps would matter much. I don't know much about my family history, so aren't those mistakes largely out of my... Counsels you seek about your family, about me, your grandfather, your parents, will all be answered at the conclusion of the trial. Now please, my dear, confess. I, Duran Wellington... Formally, Duran Wellington. Right. Please hear me now as I, formally known as Duran Wellington, confess to any wrongdoings or insensitive actions I may have committed from birth to the present day. I willingly acknowledge my many shortcomings, for ultimately, I do wish to be a part of this pure sanctuary. <gasps> Keep moving! Oh, legs are tired. Let's retire. No! They could be on our heels. Keep going. Stop! We're safe. No one is tracking us. What? We haven't caught a scent in over a day. I agree. I think it's time we rest and figure out where the heck we are. Right. Yes, I... Oh, I just want to be sure. Coral, we're fine. At least from those robe-wearing cult people. As for being safe out here, that I'm not so sure of. It's not that bad out here. Assume you don't mind the occasional rock thrown at your head. Trying to break the tension, the enchanter forces a laugh. <laughs> oh, and thanks, Bay. We owe you one. A big one. All good. I just couldn't... Let my sister go alone and blah, blah, blah. Hey, I just want to help. You did. Thanks, brother, but I'm perfectly capable without you. Ouch. Sorry. I much prefer that you're here now. It's just that you don't always have to try and save me. <laughs> Even though I just did. What about everyone back home? 
Home is in trouble. With or without me there. That's what I figured. Silence looms over the four as they rest and catch their breath. Do you think he's okay? Who? The traitor from the Silver City? His name is Durand, and we don't know for certain that he is a traitor. What does it matter? He didn't seem to have the same concern for you guys when he ditched you all for a warm bowl of soup and a bougie robe. Very city of him. It just doesn't make sense. I've been with Durand for the last week. I didn't sense any of this turmoil within him. He was a little smug, sure, but I felt everything was fine. We were bonding as a group. How could he have turned so quickly? He's been desperate for answers for a long time. Answers he will find. Not sure they're right for his mind. He must be out of his mind to stay with a bunch of lunatics like that. Lunatics who have food and shelter, and a familiarity with the unknown. And what do we have? We have each other. That's exactly what I was going to say. Right. Yes, of course we do. But we're completely lost. We need to figure out what to do and fast. Bay, did you encounter anything worth mentioning on your travels? No. Well... There was a stretch where the fog was thick, but it didn't feel wet from the condensation. I heard this humming all around me, but nothing ever approached. To be honest, this place gives me the creeps. So I moved pretty fast once I made it over the Magnificent. Oh, and speaking of the Magnificent... What? You know what? Never mind. Tell us, Bay. At this point, anything could help us. I... I saw a man lying at the bottom of the mountains. I mean, the remains of a man. I hope he wasn't with you. Yeah. Falco. His his name is Falco. I figured. Sorry to hear. Falco would have never let Durand stay with the Enlightened. I mean, they didn't even have any Hornet's whiskey. Falco was a good man. A gentle giant. Shh! They ready their weapons at the sound of a threatening growl. Everyone back to back. Now. They stand in a protected formation, armed and ready. A steady fog appears seemingly out of nowhere. Heavy footsteps can be heard walking around the perimeter of the group. Anything moves, fire. This thing, it sounds big. We'll see. Cover me. The Enchanter scurries off into the fog and disappears. Enchanter, wait. Is he crazy? You could say that. The group is keeping their heads on a swivel as the heavy footsteps and growls intensify. A loud deafening roar is heard just outside of their sight. Enchanter, you okay? Silence. Looks like it's just the three of us now. Before Bay could finish his thought, a loud explosion is heard nearby. The fog suddenly illuminates in a swath of majestic purple and pink. As quickly as the surroundings have ignited, everything goes dark. Whoa. Yeah, he can do that kind of thing. Is he human? We don't know. We're just happy he's on our side. You hope. Enchanter? I'm fine. Just in time. Whew. In time for what? The thing I could not see. All I know is it wanted to hurt me. <sighs> one of many, I think. We should only stay here for one drink. Enough said. Thank you, Enchanter. Let's get out of here. We can drink while we move. Yes, but where are we going? The city is dark and the streets are empty. Ever since the recession, the third-rate sector of the city has been running low on supplies. There is an unnatural silence in the streets. These are desperate times for the city's lower class. Gerwa, still in shock from the trauma of witnessing Henley's death, is strategically maneuvering his way towards the third-rate sector. Under no circumstances can he risk being recognized. Garan could have spies everywhere. So far, Gerwa has been able to scavenge scraps to eat, but he's run out of food. He's on a mission, and time is running out. They dwell in the well, third-rate third city, city, section city, of the city. city, city. Find the vandal selling bright red berries. Whisper the phrase. Diamond, Diamond Bay. Bay. There was, there was another, another way. way. Gerwa spends the lonesome evening in search of the produce stands. Although at this hour everything is closed, he quietly investigates each stand with the hopes of finding those bright red stone berries. Finally, with only a few hours until sunrise, he's found the remains of some stone berries on the ground. Hoping this will be the stand, Gerwa waits for the market to open. Hope is still in his heart. Gerwa is abruptly awoken by a surly man. Wake up, Outlander! Still half asleep, Gerwa attempts to gather himself. Um, s- sorry, I, I seem to have fallen asleep. Really? Smart as a prizeman, I see. Listen, I'm not an Outlander, and certainly hope I'm wiser than a prizeman. 
Yet I don't mean any disrespect by the pride. In fact, I, I take that back. Shut up and get moving before I get the silver guard lost. No need for that, sir. I'll be going now. Thank you for your time and my apologies. Gurwa hastily rises to his feet and begins to hurry off. He makes it about a block down the road when he stops. He turns back towards the stand, determination in his eyes. Stop running away. Gurwa struts confidently back towards the stand. Do you not listen? I said- Diamond Bay, there was another way. The stand owner pauses for a moment. Huh? Listen, boy, I don't know what you're talking about. Diamond Bay, there was another way. I'd turn and walk away if I were you. Diamond Bay, there was another way. A few random citizens turn towards the two after Gurwa's slight outburst. Ha! Huh, sure there was, son. Anyway, we just gotten a fresh shipment of stoneberries. Care for a bag? I promise these are the best the city has, as fresh as fresh can be. The citizens turn their attention back to what they were doing. Come closer. Gurwa inches his way closer. Closer. He leans in towards the owner. The stand owner slaps Gurwa across the face. Ouch! Hey! If you don't tell me who you are and what you want, you won't see the sun. Uh, did you have to slap me? Talk. We have eyes and arrows on you. Gurwa looks around cautiously, then turns back towards the stand owner. My name is Gurwa, and I am best friends with Duran Wellington, grandson of General Wellington. And it's come to my attention that you and I could have similar motives. You mean you also own a stand and sell stoneberries? You know very well what I mean. You think I'm impressed by you and your friend? Or does he ran away from the city anyway? What good could a couple of cowards like you lot do for the rest of us? Duran has many things, but he is no coward. And for all my weaknesses, I have something that you don't have. And it's something that you want very much. And what's that? I have knowledge of the inner workings of Garon's factions. For I am, well, was an ever runner for the High Council. They stare deeply towards each other. Then, the stand owner reaches below the counter and gently pulls out a small bird. Not another rumor bird. This little guy just heard everything you said. He's gonna fly away now and talk to somebody. If you don't have an arrow through your chest sometime within the next minute, you'll be granted a conversation with some important people. Gurwa stands completely still and swallows deeply. The small rumor bird flies away into the sky and up towards the top of a bell tower. Then seconds feel like days for Gurwa, as his fate hangs in the balance of the bird. A minute passes and he's still standing. Looks like I... An arrow whizzes past Gurwa's head, oh. sticking precisely into the side of the stand. The arrow has a note tied to it. Gurwa, shaken from the scare, grabs the note and begins to read. What does this mean? It just says sunset. The stand owner hands him a sack of stoneberries and signals for him to move along. Enjoy your stoneberries. They'll be exactly what you've been looking for. The stand owner stares down towards the bag. Gurwa takes the bag and moves along as instructed, partially confused. While walking, he innocently reaches into the sack. He pulls out another note, saturated with juice, with an address written on it. He quickly memorizes the address before dark red liquid completely obscures the ink. Whereas the city streets still hold some foot traffic, the Prairie Pride Center is completely desolate. The Pride have been pushed to the brink of starvation. After the mysterious stone shower during the day, a first of its kind, many have packed and moved out towards the outskirts of the kingdom. Those who remain spread horrible rumors of a looming threat from beyond the kingdom which may have caused the deadly stone shower. Fathorn and Bodwig march into the town center on horseback after a few evenings planning together. All right, the market is just around the corner. We gather as many people as we can to address the false allegations against me. Once we clear my family, we can figure out how Padawan was able to manipulate our friends. The two men round the corner and enter the empty town market. Hmm, that was the plan. The town is riddled with damaged food stands and debris. Not a soul in sight. Oh my god. They dismount their horses and tie them to the splintered remains of a fruit stand. Can't hold a public address without the public. Where in the world is everyone? Looks like we're gonna have to knock on some doors. I'll start on the north end and you go south. And we'll meet by the market center creek. Sounds good. Hey! The men hear a voice cry out but can't tell from which direction it came. You two see them? Bodwig and Fathorn give each other a confused glance. Fathorn aimlessly calls out in response. Good sir, come forth and we shall tell you who and what we've seen. How can we trust you? 
Are you a witch? Witch? We're no witches, sir. Please, show yourself. They can hear a group of people quietly mumbling out of view. After a few seconds, a rickety door swings open from across the market. Ah, there we are. Please join us. Bardwig? That you? Yes, I, uh, who are you? It's me, Morin. Morin, blessed to see you. Get over here. The two men embrace as Morin crosses the market square. A fellow dozen pride members slowly follow suit. Phew, are we glad to see you two. Hey, Fathorn, what's all this talk of you being a sellout, huh? It's a lie is what it is. A cold-hearted fabrication. Not an ounce of truth to it. Hmm, I thought as much. Well, we're starving to death, so, traitor or no traitor, what does it matter now? Morin gives Fathorn an uneasy stare, <laughs> then bursts into an uncomfortable laugh. Fathorn is anxious, scanning the group, anticipating an attack given what happened just days ago. Relax, Fats. We've known you and your family forever. It'll take more than a few rumors swirling outlanders on a horseback to sway my opinion on you. Outlanders? That's right. I thought it was Padwin's cronies. It all makes sense. If Padwin really did sell us out to those snakes in the city, then they'd certainly use outlanders for her to do their dirty work. No mind all that nonsense now. Do you have any food? A little. Just what we packed. No matter. The outlanders said we're getting a shipment of food from the Silvers in a few days, so it should be here soon. Shipment? From the city? But that doesn't sound right. Why not? We saved their tales at the massacre. They owe us. The small crowd agrees in unison. They do. But they're the ones who stole our reserves and put us into this whole mess. Sending us aid doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Lads, if this shipment does come, you'll be sure to taste it before the women and children. Heh. <laughs> Bard's paranoid as usual. Cautious. And with everything going on, it's best to be careful. Wait. Why did you ask if we were witches? You didn't hear? Hear what? A few thousand people evacuated the Pride just hours after that brutal stone shower. No one had ever seen a daytime storm like that before. People are talking about the end of days. Scary times, men. Out to the outskirts they fled, seeking refuge. Not sure what they'll find since there's only a few dozen families living out there. Anyway, a young girl showed up late last night, bloody and shaking. She couldn't stop saying... Morin trails off as if he's scared to finish his sentence. Saying what? She couldn't stop saying, wishes, wishes, wishes. Wishes? Why would she be repeating wish? Witches. Hence, us making sure a few of them wandering witches didn't make their way into town just now. Those people out there are starving, desperate for sustenance. They'll do anything for food. The witches will give them exactly what they want. This means... We'll have a horde of friendly-faced wandering witches knocking on our doors soon enough. Morin, we need a place to set up and plan. Between the city's shady dealings and a potential supernatural army on its way, I'd say our problems are just getting started. Back in the Silver City, the high intellects gather for a meeting of the minds. My fellow intellects, we gather here today after a wonderful few days of celebration. A celebration of our continued prosperity and safety. Why? Because our citizens will prevail during these darkest of days. While everyone agreed that the soiree was a most certain success, one person didn't have the, how should I say, the best of nights. Garon <laughs> and a few high intellects did uh, High intellect Padwin. Were you able to identify this stain on our otherwise silken sheet of an evening? High intellect Goron, we were indeed able to identify the man. Well? His name was... Um... Padwin signals to a god standing behind him. The god quickly rushes towards Padwin and whispers in his ear. Henley. Henley? Henley who? Henley... Uh, one moment. Padwin turns back towards his god. His last name, now! James, sir! Yes, Henley James. And do we know who this Henley James is, or was? A Silver City guard, actually. Went missing after they discovered your prisoner gone. A guard? And this is why I said we must strengthen our training program. Can't risk having... Wait. Prisoner. Gone. What are you bloody talking about? The prisoner. 
The one you personally detained. Gurwa? Yes, I intellect. He's gone. He's gone? How can that be? We had multiple guards on watch. I am sorry, sir. I don't know. I just started here. Garon, if I may interject, this deceased guard was seemingly talked into allowing Gurwa to escape rather easily. If this Gurwa is that sharp with his tongue, how many more might he sway? You interrupt to say what we are already thinking. Obviously, we need to send out a brigade for Gurwa immediately. Of course. I'll have our best men sent out today. Not today. Now. Send them now. Right this second. I want the family of this Henley James detained. On what charges? Treason, of course. The crime of guilt by association. Must I explain everything in detail to you nitwits? Need I remind you that we are the intellects. So you all better start acting like it. The high intellect stands still in place. Garon stares at him expectantly. And you're still here? Why? You want me to- I want you to send men after Gurwa. Right away, sir. The high intellect scurries off. Now, we've certainly wasted enough of our breath on the worthless Gurwa. On to more important matters. The master plan is in motion. The tainted reserve sacks are set to be returned to the pride imminently. Assuming they're as unsuspecting and starving as we know they are, I assume the whole population of hungry mouths will diminish quite quickly. I know the pride all too well. They will undoubtedly consume those reserves within days. Your plan will work wonders. I know, because I came up with it. But there's even more brilliance at hand. Per our calculations, given the steady decrease in resources within our own walls, there soon will not be enough food to share with the third-rate citizens without affecting our own first-rate bounty. Obviously, I would never allow us to be so negatively affected. Hence, in concurrence with the tainted reserve sacks, I have launched a new initiative, a humanitarian mission of sorts that promises any third-rate citizens an immediate increase of their familial level to second rate. What must they do? We've never just granted a level upgrade in our kingdom's centuries of existence. You must be born into your level as a birthright. Don't be such a simpleton. The times are changing and we must change too. Except no one will actually be changing levels. We have told the men of the third rate citizens that they must help deliver reserves to the pride in exchange for a level upgrade and a bounty of free food for their families while they're gone. They're already on their way, but the third-rate citizens don't know the sacks are poisoned. The living pride who don't immediately eat the tainted reserves will rebel against the men who brought poison to their doors, and they'll slaughter one another without our having to raise a single finger. But what about the food for the third-rate families? I thought you said our own resources are running low. How can we just give them free food? Because they won't be eating our food. They will be enjoying the excess of tainted reserves. So meanwhile, back at home in those lowly third-rate quarters, as their men march toward their own demise, well, let's say everyone else will be sleeping with very full stomachs. Very good, Goron. Very good indeed. An exhausted Durand, having just completed a public confession, is standing in a meal line. His once confident posture now slouched. The line slowly shuffles along. He continues in his mental fog as he replays the awkward public address. After a few seconds of mindless reflection, he is nudged by a fellow nameless enlightened standing behind him. Ahem. <clears throat> Durand snaps out of his daze and meanders forward. That's the worst part. Excuse me? The trial. The humiliation. Yeah, I hope so. It is. Don't you feel freer now? Cleansed? I feel many things, not one of which is clean or free. Ah, (laughs) you're funny. Soon enough, you'll feel free from all that backward behavior and thinking you once displayed. Your wounds of your past might still be a bit fresh. I guess. Maybe. The enlightened member indicates the head enlightened. She is our savior, you know. We were the first. First of what? The first perfect society. 
under her auspices, we will never misstep. We will always understand one another without judgment. Mistakes are a thing of the past. That's the point of the trial. That is why you should feel clean. I'm not sure you can clean a human. Pardon? Humans. I'm not so sure we can be totally cleansed. We can learn from our mistakes, yeah, but we can't be completely free from them. Not even with some new robes and a few confessions. Um, if you don't mind, I'll go around you. Thank you, my fellow enlightened. Good day. Confused, Duran lets the strange man pass by. He now turns his attention to the meal counter. I understand you, my fellow enlightened. Durand looks over his shoulder to see a tall man towering over him. He is slender in build, with a warm and understanding face. Sure, I understand. But I wouldn't say as much here, if you catch my drift. Taking the hint, Durand changes the subject. Hmm. You have the scent of a... Nautic, formally. Ah, Nautic. Do you know your family's rate when they were in the city, you know, before the split? I do. Third rate. Understood. You see, my family was... Oh, I know of your famous, well, former famous name. The Nautics always spoke highly of the Wellingtons. Wait, do you mean you know my... Don't get too excited. I only know stories of your grandfather's good graces. Anything else, unfortunately, I cannot help you with. Silence falls between the two as they shuffle along the food line. Don't be discouraged. Look at the two of us. Third rate, first rate, Nautic, intellect... Just goes to show, no matter who you are or where you're from, everyone is seeking something similar. In that moment, Durand is overcome with the recent memory of his mission. Coral, Bello, Gurwa, the recession, all come flooding into his mind. And yet, it disappears just as quickly. I... I need answers. I'm here for answers. Then you've come to the right place. Spoken like a man who's received answers himself. Sure. Somewhat. (laughs) Somewhat? You were willing to give up your life, your identity for somewhat? My former identity. My former life. What were they? I didn't choose them. In here, in this place, I have chosen to be. Me and myself alone. Without the societal facade or familial fortifications. But who are we without acknowledging where we've come from? Without accepting our experience in life. Careful, my fellow enlightened. One would do his best to adapt to these surroundings sooner rather than later. Enjoy your meal. I'll see you this evening. This evening? What's happening this evening? A gathering in the dark. A weekly occurrence here. I'd not miss it if I were you. The tall enlightened laughs as he fills his bowl with an unrecognizable soup and wanders off. Duran finishes filling his bowl and makes his way towards his quarters. As he's about to enter, an arm grabs him from behind. He spins, spilling some soup, and lays eyes on the head enlightened. Settling in. Yes, yes, thank you for everything, of course, and the hospitality of your people is most welcoming. They are not my people. They are just people. Right. Uh, Apologies. No need to apologize. Remember, you've been cleansed, unable to make a mistake or a misstep. You just are who you are now and forever. You'll get used to it. Yes, I'm sure, but when can we discuss my family or our family? You mentioned that we'd speak- And we definitely will. Great. Tonight. Tonight. Oh, okay. Well, you could come in now and we could- Tonight, my dear. The head, enlightened, smiles blankly and glides away from Durand, with her nose held high in the air. Durand, frustrated, enters his quarters and drops his soup sloppily onto the table, his appetite completely spoiled. As the sun sets within the third-rate quarter of the Silver City, Gurwa anxiously approaches the door of the addressed memorized from the mysterious note. He knocks on the door, his heart races with anticipation, and yet no one answers. Uh, hello? Gurwa hesitates to knock again, as he isn't entirely sure that he's not being set up. Please answer. Gurwa hears some faint voices whispering from behind the door. He inhales deeply and decides upon a more aggressive approach. He raises his fist and slams it against the door. I didn't just risk my life to come here and be shut out. I am here to help. Now open the door. 
Silence. Gurwa himself is even surprised at his spontaneous confidence. Then a lock is turned and the door swings open. It can't be. A familiar woman steps forward from the shadows. Gurwa stands in shock. Tristan? Hello, you old sack of stone berries. Chapter 8. The Wandering Coral and company have survived another nearly sleepless night within the unknown. Although they've made it through the long evening, they are still without direction. All right, everyone. How are we feeling today? <sighs> like I could sleep for another day. Rest I did not. My mind filled with thoughts. Well, we've made it this far, after all. We have to keep moving. Sheesh. You sound like Durand. No one says anything. Bello changes his tone. You're right. We have made it this far. Hopefully today is another day without any fog monsters. Yes, let's hope for no fogsters. Hey sis, let's just face the reality. We're lost. How so? We've been leaving intentional tracks. If we were going in circles, we would have noticed by now. Who's gonna tell her? Do I always have to be the big bad older brother? Bay looks towards Bello, but Bello keeps his head down. The enchanter nervously shakes his head. What are you talking about? Look. Bay takes a few steps and indicates his trail of footsteps. Okay. Wait for it. Wait for... Coral's voice fades. After a few moments, Bay's trail of footsteps begin to vanish. You see? No more tracks. This isn't soil or any sort of element we're familiar with. For all we know, we could have been walking in circles for days. That's impossible. I would have thought so myself had I not just seen my footsteps magically disappear. It's almost as if this place is keeping us prisoners. How in the world did I not notice this? Because you've been pushing us forward. We've been trying to feed off your energy, and we didn't want to deflate your spirits anymore. Bay, this is a big deal! Why are you trying to coddle me? Why didn't you tell me right away? We just noticed yesterday. Then you should have told me yesterday! I didn't want to upset you further. Bello and the Enchanter exchange uncomfortable knowing glances. Why do you keep saying that? What do you mean, I'm upset? I'm upset now that we've been walking in circles. But you've seemed a bit distracted. I am not distracted. I'm completely focused and determined to get us out of here. Nothing else at all is on my mind but our safety. Coral seems as if she has more to say, but she stops herself. Bay, Bella, and the Enchanter all sit in silence, waiting for Coral to finish her thought. Duran's decision to stay behind is his own, and there's nothing else I, we, can do about it. Bello fills the sudden silence. Right. Which makes you the next most bossy person in the pack. So, where are we headed now, leader? Bello gives Coral a soft, sarcastic smirk. <laughs> Honestly, I have no idea. Seems to me you're lost. A voice suddenly booms throughout the fog-laden sky. The group looks around with confusion, ready as always for a fight. I could tell you where to go. Show yourself! <laughs> If you wish. <laughs> Let's move. Now, the group begins to sprint hastily but are blocked by an impenetrable wall of fog. The layer of fog feels like thick stone to the touch. Over here! The group scurries behind Bello in the opposite direction. But another thick wall of fog flashes before them. Oh, come on! <laughs> what is this? Who are you? You asked me to show myself. And here I am fog swirls mightily around the four trapped companions. This is bonkers! Enchanter, any tricks up your sleeves? The enchanter readies his arms in preparation for a spell. <laughs> I don't know, but I'll give it a go. The fog forms two enormous hands which grasp at the enchanter. A dull spark of purple light flickers and quickly fades. The enchanter struggles to free himself from the fog hands. I guess not. It seems I've been stopped. Bay rushes towards the trapped enchanter, but the fog appears to swipe at his feet, knocking and pinning him to the ground. Ah! Bay! Coral shoots arrows aimlessly towards the surrounding fog, but they shoot without hitting their mark, disappearing into the distance. Um, Bello, any ideas? I wonder what the Rand would do. Are you being sarcastic at a time like this? No, no! I mean, I have this bag! In that moment, Bello remembers he grabbed Duran's bag from back in the enlightened village. Out of desperation, he dumps the contents of the bag onto the strange ground. Streams of silver light shine brightly upon Bello's face. Aha! Uh -huh. Bello looks down at the brightly shining objects. 
their reflected beams of light seem to make the fog dissipate. He grabs one of the shining gem-like objects and holds it in front of his face. The fog before him begins to fade. Maybe this will work! Bello rushes towards the enchanter with the bright gem. The grip of the fog fades as he approaches, and the enchanter becomes free. Bello moves towards Bay and does the same, freeing him with the bright beam of light. And with the light of life, now you shall know where to find me. What is that thing? What are those? I don't know. It's like a gem or something. It feels like a broken piece of a mirror. Five pieces, I see. One for Bello, Bay, Coral, and me. Enchanter grabs one of the gems from the ground and hands the other two to Coral and Bay. A small ray of light emanates from each of their pieces. A fifth piece remains on the ground as the group stares at it. That one must have been four. We shall leave it on the ground. Maybe one day by Durand it will be found. And with the light of life, now you shall know where to find me. Is that what the voice said? Look, it only makes certain portions of the fog wall disappear. Maybe that's how we'll find him, or whatever that voice is. Could be a trap. Seems like we're already trapped, mate. I say we follow whatever path appears. I agree. Lead the way, sis. For this magic in our hand, we must thank Durand. The group follows Coral further into the unknown, through various partings in the thick wall of fog. They move steadily with purpose, caution, and a literal glimmer of hope. Fathorn and Bodwig are handing out small rations of what's left of their food. The dozen or so remaining members of the Pride are scattered around a dimly lit room. Out of fear and caution, they have barricaded the only known entrance as they debate their next move. We appreciate the food. Bodwig nods solemnly. Don't we? Of course. Fats. Thank you, Fats. Oh, thank you. Of thank course. You. Thank you, Fats. Bodwig, thank you. Ungrateful lot you are. It's really no problem. But I'm afraid starving might not be our only issue. Yeah, I'd rather not fight a bunch of wandering witches on an empty stomach. But at least we'll be light on our loafers, hey lads? <laughs> the various remaining members of the Pride let out an enfeebled laugh. You know it's not all bad. Not long ago, a silver stumbled upon my home. Not just any silver either. A high guardsman. A good man. He was on a mission to find some answers. Not too dissimilar from the one Bello is on. Gave me a bit of hope, is all. Made me feel like there was something still worth fighting for. Hold on a second. You met with an intellect? Why didn't I know about this? We haven't really been speaking too highly of those in the city, so I kept it to myself. And besides, the last few days have been a bloody blur. Must have slipped my mind. Did this silver say anything else that might be of use to us? Just that we are not alone in this struggle. We're a few thousand. But now we are a divided few thousand. If we survive, you know, the whole starvation and wandering witch horde, it's up to us to reunite our own kingdom. What kingdom? All the gossip made them flee, full of panic and fear. Our elders would be ashamed of what we've become. We pride used to confront danger. Now we scurry at the first sight of it? With no leadership, even the strongest of kingdoms can lose their way. What other options do we have? We can always chase down that traitor Padwin. What would that solve? Nothing. But at least I could see the shame in his eyes before I- Listen to us. Praising Silvers. Slighting our own pridesmen. Times really have changed. Let's hope they're changing for the better. A little pride girl shushes the group and silently tiptoes into the center of the room. Her eyes are moving rapidly in all directions. Then... Suddenly, sounds of movement and life emerge from beyond the barricaded door. Ah, what are the chances? I guess we pride are not all as spineless as I suspected. Morin races towards the door to investigate. Just as he grabs the handle, the girl slams her body against the door, preventing Morin from opening it. Out of the way, girl! She fearfully shakes her head and refuses to move. Morin pauses and releases the handle. Toss her out of the way, man! Let's go! They might have food! Morin stares down towards the girl who slumped to the floor, blocking the main entrance. Wishes, wishes, wishes. Toss her out of the way! Morin signals to everyone to remain silent. The sounds outside the door begin to fade into silence. What is it? They're here. We can just go outside and wish for them to go away. She's right. This door is not opening. For once we agree. Everyone remain silent and we'll wait it out. But we're almost out of food! Why don't you go outside and wish for some then, huh? Everyone, calm down. They're 
There's no sense in hiding. We're not here to cause you any harm. In fact, we're here to help. We've helped a great many of you already. They were so lost and so very hungry. <laughs> To hell with you! I'm going out! A pridesman rushes towards the door, and Morin slams him to the ground. Don't move. Final warning. From his back, the pridesman obeys. You witch! You have nothing to offer us! We will not exit until you're gone. Now why don't you go antagonize the next village? Unfortunately for you, this is the only village left. (laughs) Bards! How much food do we have? Bodwig shuffles through their bag and reveals a single loaf of bread. The group mumbles worriedly. Now's no time to panic. We need to stick together and we need a plan fast. A blindfolded Gerwa is being escorted down a long tunnel. Tristan, are you still with me? Why must I be blindfolded? Is this completely necessary? No one responds to Gerwa's inquiries. Yet he can hear multiple footsteps shuffling alongside him. This isn't how you should treat an old friend. Gurwa hears a woman snicker to herself. Uh, I knew it. Now please, take this off. Quiet. I will not be quiet. I've gone through too much to be held captive by who I presume to be my companions in this whole mess. A door suddenly swings open, and Gurwa is shoved into the center of what feels like a large room. Remove your blindfold. Gurwa slips off the blindfold to see that he's in the center of a half-circular meeting table. Welcome, Gurwa. High intellect, Bordois? That is correct. And I am sorry about your friend, Henley. What are you doing here? I could ask the same about you. You sent me here. Why didn't you just tell me at the soiree you supported my cause? Too risky to speak of such things there. Don't be fooled by how lively those gatherings get. Everyone is listening, judging. Plotting. Why couldn't you have just told me where to go directly? We needed to see if you had it in you. Seems you do. Your people almost just killed me with an arrow. You were never in real danger, unless we felt you could be a liability. This movement of ours is far too important to tiptoe around friendly feelings. Speaking of which, Tristan insisted that you be given an honest chance to prove yourself. So, here we are. Right. What is this, some sort of resistance? Ah, no. The term resistance is too pedestrian. We all believe our kingdom needs a proper reset. Gone are the days when our ancestors would live off the backs of those below them. This city has, or, well, used to have more than enough resources to provide a stable and fair life for all. So, socialism? Not so simply. We still value hard work and responsibility and all of that. Then what is it? Something like a fair starting point for every intellect. We feel the gap has grown too far, too wide, too unsustainable. You're a man of tremendous wealth and power. Frankly, I'm surprised you'd support this sort of social movement. I think you're just surprised there are still rational minds in positions of power. Maybe. And yet, given the state of the Four Kingdoms, our mission seems rather to be a moot point. We have no reasonable or reliable idea as to what is happening out there in the wider world or how it will affect us. For now, all we can do is control what we can control for the betterment of all. And that is? Isn't it obvious? Remove Goron. Now, now, silence, everyone. Yes, it is true. With Goron in power, we will not be able to prepare for the uncertainty of future days. We have no real power over the elements of the environment. Perhaps we've overstayed our welcome in these lands, and this is nature's means of making the world right. But either way, we cannot do what is best for anyone, so long as Gauron remains in charge. Okay, so I agree with your points, but I have to ask, why all of this showing for me? You're essential. How so? Because Gauron sees you as a threat. Me? A threat to a powerful man like Garon? How? Because you're good. Because people like you, and you know more than you realize. 
You're high intellect and extremely well respected. You must be able to think of something. Respect doesn't mean what it used to, Go. Uh, and besides, you know a lot about their routines, which even I do not. But what can I do? We can't overpower the guards. He has the support of the entire city. The late Henley, he was a soldier, was he not? Yes. And in just a matter of hours, he went from nearly slashing your throat to sacrificing his life for you, did he not? He did. But it wasn't for me. It was for his family. Exactly. You were able to break through to him. Who's to say you can't do that to others? <laughs> I'm not saying you grab a sword and rush to the front line, Guma. We have plenty of men and women for that. We need your help through your wits and your heart. Gerwa glances towards Tristan, who smirks and looks down towards the ground. What do you want me to do? Tristan here will provide you with your mission. This meeting is adjourned. As the room clears, Gerwa saunters over towards Tristan. Glad to have you on board. But I hope you can be of some use to us without your precious Durand by your side. Don't worry. I've learned more from Durand than I'm willing to admit. But really, it's great to see you again. Yes, it's been too long. When we were kids, I would have never thought to change a single thing about this city. Now look at us. Starting a revolution of sorts. More like a reset. <laughs> Let me show you to a room. You can get some rest and we'll meet later for supper to discuss your role. Sure. Oh, um, but for supper, you don't happen to have any- Blackfin stew? <laughs> I'll check. You remembered. Tristan punches Gerwa lightly on the arm. <laughs> I see you're stronger than you once were. Must be all that hearty stew. A large group of enlightened congregate around an open fire. Durand helps himself to a seat next to the tall enlightened man he met earlier. The head enlightened can be seen having a deep discussion silently off to the side of the fire. So, this is the big night meeting, huh? You are correct. Excellent, because I'm starting to question what it is exactly that I'm doing here. I keep those questions to yourself. Good evening, everyone. And a perfect evening it is. Tonight's point of discussion is quite an important one, so please pay attention. Durand raises his hand. We don't usually take questions at these meetings. Well, I've never been to one of these meetings, so I wouldn't know. And now you do. As I was saying... My parents! I believe I've been patient enough. You promised answers. I need answers. You must understand that answers can't always reveal themselves immediately. Now! Everyone is silent. The crackling of the fire cuts through the tension. A determined Duran stares through the head enlightened. She whispers in the ear of a man next to her. He nods. This outburst is most unwelcome and inappropriate. We will consider this misstep a symptom of your recent traumas. You want answers. You must earn them. Wasn't the trial my penance? Since a few words seem to have erased a lifetime of sin, haven't I earned the right to be told who my parents are? You know, I turned on my friends for this, whatever this is. Bring her here. An enlightened nods and scurries off into the darkness. Seconds go by and Durand hears some whispering from within a tent not far off. The head enlightened stares down Durand with an expressionless face. Uh, what is this? No one answers. The sounds of wheels rolling in dirt can be heard from within the darkness. Durand gazes intently, waiting for the sound to reveal itself. The enlightened helper is pushing an elderly person in a wheelchair towards them. Who is that? Who are you? The head enlightened rises to her feet and steps away from the light of the fire to whisper into this elderly person's ear. Durand still cannot make out who this person is. The chairs push towards him into the light. It's a woman. Who are you? What does this have to do with me? Durand Wellington, as self-centered as ever. It is a familiar voice. A am I supposed to know who you are? Imagine how much more you'd know if you came to class. Madame Fajan? No, this, this can't be. You always thought you knew more than you did, and less than you wanted to. We were told you passed on almost ten years ago. They told you what they wanted you to hear. What? Why? 
I'm sorry, I, I just don't understand. Remember, learning is a lifelong lesson. I came here in search of answers I could not find in the city. Have you found what you were looking for? Here, the searching stops, and we find ourselves. I can't find myself if I don't know anything about my family. This woman is claiming to be my grandmother This and... woman is the last of your family. What? What do you mean? Your parents are dead, my dear. Duran's blood leaves his face. They left you with your grandmother and grandfather in search of a new beginning for themselves. A better life, so they said. A better life? Without me? They were your parents by blood, not by priority. I am sorry you had to hear it from me. How did they die? The city righted them. Like your grandfather, your parents were taken from this world unfairly. The city was petrified that you'd follow suit, a noble son of stature, and upset the established order. Why? On what charges were they deemed guilty? None, my dear. Those in power need no reason to take a life that stands in their way. Who did it? The High Council. A young Gauron, of course, had his criminal hand in the decision, claiming it was the start of a new phase of intellectual integrity. So, that's it then. An abandoned orphan, betrayed by both his parents and his kingdom. What's the point then of this whole crusade? Remember when I said you made the right choice? It's because you did. The kingdoms are part of the past. We are the future. Your parents saw the future and stood for something true and pure. This was their original idea, their vision for you, for us. They left you to protect you. It would be a shame if their only son was the one to disrupt it and continue to fight for the fading kingdoms. Madame Fajian, my parents believed in this place? The madame nods her head. Duran looks around dimly, his face filled with dread. Your parents wanted this for you. My parents wanted this without me. You're misunderstanding. You are here for a reason. This is your destiny. Duran looks towards his old mentor for wisdom, for any sign of guidance. The madame remains silent, although not averting his gaze, her eyes inflamed by the light of the fire. Duran swallows deeply and turns his back on the head enlightened. Where do you think you're going? To find my friends. For what purpose? Their mission will fail. They and their misguided ways have no purpose in this new world. This new world is not one I want to live in. Why? Let the old kingdoms crumble. Once they fall, we will have our pick of the remaining people for potential converts. The best of the lot to start a new world, pure of sin, ready for a new age of humanity. Exactly what your parents wanted. Delusional. You are all delusional. My parents, you... Duran looks towards Madame Fajian. I apologize, Madame, but you're all delusional. One need never apologize for what one believes in, just for what one does or doesn't do. The madame smiles and winks knowingly at Durand as he walks past a group of outraged enlightened. They look to the head enlightened, wondering what they should do. Let him go. He is not worthy of our world anyway. His parents would be sick to their stomachs at the sight of him. I did exactly what you told me to do, but like I told you, it was going to be more difficult than you'd imagine. He was the brightest and most cunning student I've ever had the pleasure of teaching. Enough, you old hag. What good are you to us now if you couldn't get him to stay? Get her out of my sight! A few enlightened followers wheel Madame Fajian out from under the light of the campfire. Now, I need a former Nordic one with excellent tracking skills to follow him back to his group of friends and to kill them all. They must not make it to the garden. Coral and company have moved tirelessly across the vast and desolate landscape, shiny gems in hand. They move cautiously through the occasional fog wall that splits in parts in certain places according to their beams of light. I'm afraid to think where these walls are leading us. We have no choice. Keep moving. 
magic I can do, but this fog is something new. I actually have a good feeling about this. Suddenly, the light from their gems begin to fade. I take that back. The crystals in their hands begin to grow dimmer, and the fog wall creeps around them from all angles. Closing in on them, the four companions begin to stumble over each other through the thick of the fog. The menacing voice from earlier continues laughing. Huddle together in hope. The four friends stand in a circle, and they all drop their gems to the ground, embracing one another instead. They hug, fearing the worst. At this point, I'm exhausted. Just take us already. Stay strong, Bellow. I I never got to tell you this. You're the strongest person I've ever met. Bay, not now. It's okay, sister. It's over. The rough walls are now inches from the group. It presses in on the foursome with more and more force. At least in the end, I'll die with my friends. This is not the end. Suddenly, a strong stream of light erupts from the pile of crystals at the feet of the four companions. The fog completely disappears. What used to be the grey fog that riddled the unknown has now evaporated, showing patches of bright green brush instead. Trees, vegetation, and miles of green grass surround the confused group. Are we in the afterlife? Coral and Bay open their eyes and unlock their embrace. The enchanter rises from the ground where he had lain in the fetal position. It's as if they are in a brand new world. What are we seeing? I don't know. Is this real? The enchanter crawls towards a bush nearby, sprinkled with glowing and ripe berries. I wouldn't, friend. The enchanter doesn't hesitate. He grabs a bright berry. He scoffs it down as the group waits anxiously to see its effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This doesn't seem to be a trick. They are safe to pick. How does a landscape just change in the blink of an eye? We saw this type of thing in Enchanter. That was a magic I've been shown. This seems to be something unknown. So, we're either very dead or very lucky. Either way, let's eat. The group begins to scoff down as many berries as possible. Mmm. 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 Tasty little things, aren't they? Mm. Rich with flavor. I've never had anything like them. They begin to pack their bags with food when something catches Coral's eye. Does anyone else see that? The four look towards where the pile of crystals had been. Coral walks over and picks up what appears to now be an extremely reflective plate. They formed a mirror. Looks Mm. like a plate, maybe. Perfect timing. Now that we've found some food... As Coral holds the plated mirror, suddenly the sounds of footsteps can be heard from behind a nearby bush. Wait, did anyone else hear that? (laughs) <laughs> Chewing a lot, hearing I cannot. Something reveals itself from behind the bushes, but just as quickly vanishes. There! I didn't see anything. A man or something just right over there. Well, at least we have plenty of these berries to share. What do you want to do, sis? We should try and follow it. Oh, him. All right, let's go. Nowhere left to go but here. The group stops before they can even move. You have finally found what you have been looking for. The shrubbery behind the foursome opens up to reveal a long and beautiful pathway, lined with trees and shrubbery. Is this... the garden? I mean, why not? I'm just about open to anything at this point. The path ahead is as safe and sound as those berries. Enjoy the sustenance, and follow at your leisure. The group nods in agreement with one another, and make their way down the mysterious pathway. Coral still carrying the strange crystal plate. High intellect Garon is alone in his quarters, a large dwelling with furnishings made from the finest silver and marble. He pours himself a ruby rose drink and walks over to his open window, which reveals a staggering view of the entire city. Ah, another wonderfully crisp night sky within the most beautiful city in all four kingdoms. The only city in all four kingdoms. Garon is startled by a knock at his door. Coming! He grabs a silver robe and swings open the large stone door to see a high-ranking city general. General? This better be important. The brigade you dispatched has sent news. And? While they weren't able to catch the outlaw Gurwa, they did, however, snatch two men of some significance. Puzzling. Anyone outside of our council hardly carries any news one would deem significant. They check out. Former citizens, apparently. 
And important ones at that. Ooh, tantalizing. Their names. Now. Um, their names. Anxious, the general unfolds a piece of paper and clears his throat. <clears throat> oh, here we are. I hope you don't fluster this easily in battle. Do the names Jacques and Ray ring a bell? They refuse to admit their full identities, but a few of the older officials claim they used to be high intellects. Is that possible? My, my, my. Now isn't that something? The return of the drunk and the fool. Where are they being held? Our main cells, underneath the council hall. Try not to lose these two this time. In fact, tell Padwin to personally pay a visit to the two. Certainly, High Intellect. Any word on the delivery of the tainted reserves? No news regarding the reserves. They should be nearing the Pride now. I assume the rumor birds are just delayed. Oh, and, and the, um, uh, um... Uh, and the, 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 the general uncomfortably unfolds his piece of paper once more. I can happily report that we've prepared nearly 35% of tainted reserves to be distributed to the remaining third-rate citizens within our walls. We expect that number to jump up to 50 to 80% by the end of the week. Well done, General. And with that second bit of good news, I will celebrate with a second helping of this ancient wine, rumored to be made with the berries from the garden itself. <laughs> Not that I believe in such tales. Garon gleefully raises his glass. The general stands uncomfortably. I'd offer you some, General, but you can't afford to lose your sense in a serious time like this. No explanation needed, sir. Am I dismissed? For starters, you were never summoned, but yes. Go stand watch over those two dimwits, and I will reprimand them first thing tomorrow. Yes, sir. Before the general could finish his sentence, Garon slams the door in his face. Chapter 9, The Reveal The remaining pride are still trapped within the rotting stone-damaged cabin. The wandering witches seem to have multiplied and sound relentless in their taunting and scratching. Bodwig, like the rest of the group, grows impatient. Our food is nearly gone, and there's no point in waiting around for them to find a way in. Morin has a point. It's time the pride stick up for themselves, hungry or no. Finally, you've come to your senses. But there's children in here, bards. We can be reckless with our own lives, but not with theirs. That's why I'm going out, for the sake of my child, my daughter who disappeared. I respect that. I really do. But what are you going to do, negotiate with the supernatural? Someone has to. Well, not until we have a legitimate plan. We've been here for nearly a day and haven't come up with one. We will. Listen, Fats. I've lost nearly everything. The only thing I have left is my son, who is waiting alone at our house, which for all we know has been overrun by these monsters. What is the point in waiting around any longer? So, what's the plan? We just open the door and you sprint like mad? I mean, I have seen you run. Not good. Bodwig scans the room and breaks off a leg from an overturned table. You've also seen me angry. Bodwig winks at Fathorn. As Bodwig nears the front door, with his makeshift club in hand, the sounds of a dozen or more wagons can be heard from the distance. Soon after, the scratching of the witches stops. Outside has become silent. Hello? Is anybody here? We've been sent from the Silver City, asked to deliver these reserves from the great high intellect Goron as an extension of his goodwill and graces. One of the pride rushes towards the door. Morin grabs him. Wait. Is anyone in there? Please, we were told to ensure delivery of these food reserves. Our family's lives are at stake. Tricksters. All of them. I don't know. Why would he tell us that lives are at stake? You must be in there. We've traveled a long way and have hungry families ourselves back at home. We suspect those reserve sacks are poisoned. Poisoned? Why would they be poisoned? This is from a reserve batch that will also feed our own family. We must make this delivery properly in order to secure food for our children. Probably trying to trick us into sympathy or something. I'm not buying it. Then you better send word back home not to eat anything that came from the High Council. Treacherous bunch of backstabbing thieves that they are. The third-rate intellects are mumbling to themselves, confused as to what to do, as to what they should believe. Shh, something's not right. Wait, do you guys see that? What is that? Hey you, cloaked figures, reveal yourselves. Sounds of scuffling feet are heard from behind the door. 
Panicked grumbling erupts from the third-rate intellects outside. Run! Hide! There's too many of them! Sounds of bows being fired are heard from within the cabin. Screams from the third-rate citizens penetrate the small space, as howls and cackling from the witches pierce the ears. The remaining pride look around uncomfortably, uncertain how to react. Bodwig grabs the door handle, ready to burst into action. You can't go out there, Bodwig! Like hell I can't! If you go, I go. Everyone looks to Fathorn. He takes a deep breath. The children remain inside, hidden behind the overturned table. Everyone else, grab anything you can use as a weapon. The remaining adult pridesmen ready their weapons. We're ready. On three. We all move fast and spread out, help whoever looks like they're in trouble. Wait a second. Fathorn grabs the wooden leg from out of Bodwig's hand and rushes over towards an old lantern. Anyone have any stones? We need a spark. The elders used to tell tales about those witches not being too keen on a flame. The pride girl quickly rushes over with two stones. She hands them confidently to Fathorn. Good girl. Light it up, Fats. Fathon slams the two rocks together and lights a spark, igniting the oil-soaked wood. He then hands the torch back to Bodwig. Bodwig then goes down a line, igniting the other pridesmen's weapons. Why does it seem like we're always saving the lives of these silly silvers? Because we are. One, two, three. The pridesmen swing open the door and shout in unison as they make their way into the chaotic melee. Gerwa and Tristan are walking down an unusually quiet city avenue. The once vibrant street is desolate, underneath an ominous foggy grey sky. Hmm. I've never seen it like this before. It's usually so busy. Not the street. I mean the sky. Look. Gerwa looks up. Whoa. That's unusual. Very. I, I wonder if it's like this everywhere because of, well, you know. The end of times? Something like that. So, where are we going? To see you prove your worth. Huh? This way. Tristan pulls Girl off down a side alley. I'm confused. Who could we possibly find to help us overthrow a corrupt regime in this dead-end alley? Tristan playfully puts Girl in a headlock. Okay, you win. No more sarcasm. Tristan lets go of Girl and indicates the wall ahead. We're here. Just wait. The two wait patiently. So, do I prove my worth with patience in this disgusting back alley? Tristan doesn't seem to react to Gerwa's sarcasm. Very well. Hey, remember when you couldn't catch that baby black fin? A loud whistling is suddenly heard from high above. Both Tristan and Gerwa stare up towards the top of the building. This him. This is him. If not, well, you know what happens to both of you. I know. The men toss ropes over the side of the building and slide down to the street with ease. Impressive. One minute. One minute for what? For you to convince me. This is Captain... Former. Yes, former Captain Denny Dubois. Without him, we don't stand a chance at any sort of uprising. Forty-five seconds. You'll give us all the time we need after the favors we've done for you. Listen, girl. Hey, watch it! I've been around long enough to know that it doesn't matter what side you're on, or what cause you believe in. All that matters to me and the people I work with is the safety of our families. Denis peers up above to the grey skies. And by the looks of things, it appears that might be out of our control. Socio-political squabbling aside. Goa, please fill him in on our social-political squabbles. Okay. So, from what I can gather... You're a man that holds tremendous respect from the military, both active and retired. That's an understatement. Yet you're not a fan of the city's leader who was born into nepotism and leads with cruel indifference. But as a man of codified honor, you seem to have made a vow to always protect your city. Get to the point. Geron is a manifestation of narcissism and evil. He doesn't care about you, me, or even his fellow high god. This city is near a breaking point. If we don't regain balance soon, well, it doesn't matter if the sun shines through again or if the world collapses around. Either way, we're done. But all we can do is control what we can control. And fortunately, we can control the fate of this city. Denny, the disappearances. Disappearances? Hundreds of third-raters have gone missing over the last few days. 
apparently with the promise of citizenship upgrades and food for their families, they were sent delivering food to the Pride. But we haven't heard from them at all. Who do you think made these orders? Isn't it obvious? Those third raiders are delivering poison reserve sacks to the Pride. Geron knows this recession is going to hit us hard eventually. And he is eliminating hungry mouths. So what do you expect from us? An assassination? First, convince your colleagues to quietly rally against Garon's tyranny. We don't need to shed blood, we just need to boil it. What makes you think they will listen? Henley James. Denny turns and nods at his men, and they hold their heads in silence for a few moments. Henley James served under me when he first enlisted. He was a good soldier. Then, without hesitation, the military men break apart and scatter in different directions. Wait, so what does that mean? I think it means that Henley's sacrifice may have been the tipping point. What now? Did it work? I think so. Let's head back to the main house in the meantime. Boudoir will know what to do. Duran moves aimlessly through the scattered fog of the unknown. He speaks softly to himself. I am Durand, parentless and peerless, a Wellington by name and a nobody by trade. Without family or friends and without a way? Duran suddenly sees a staggered beam of light up ahead. Unless... He rushes forward through the thick fog and picks up the bright gem left behind by his former companions. Gerwa, you knew these would come in handy. Duran instinctually knows that the crystal will light his way, and begins to follow the course laid out before him. Meanwhile, the tall enlightened man stalks behind him, bow ready in hand, just out of sight. Jacques and Ray are sitting together in a dimly lit jail cell. They arrived on the mainland just days ago and were apprehended not long after. What were we thinking? Remind me why we came here again? To save our people. That's why. Sure, we're in a bit of a bind. But we're just going to have to find a way out of this. We really thought we'd just waltz into the city we abandoned, which happens to be run by a genocidal dictator, without any repercussions. Fools we are. Gowron's had it out for us since the split. You know, once he gets word of our capture, his smug face will reveal itself from behind that very door. Let's not let it get to us. We know what we have to do. We weren't even able to make contact with anyone. This was all for nothing. Think of our people back on the island. They're basically running out of time. We will find a way. What makes you so sure? Because I have to. My kids believed. An unseen man enters the cell area. Hey, you. The man turns. It's Padwin. Who is your superior? Padwin scoffs at Ray's question. My superior is your worst nightmare. My worst nightmare is having to pay my bar tab. Funny guy, are you? I respect that. Amusing yourselves in there since there's not too much else to be laughing about. Seriously, who do you report to? Chances are he's an old friend. You see, the two of us used to serve the city. Actually had a pretty high ranking. I wouldn't know. I just started my official title as a member of the High Council. Ray laughs aloud. Jacques remains hesitant, knowing that Ray is toying with the man. You used to have to earn your titles in this great city. At least that's when it was a great city. I'll have you know that you're speaking to two former high intellects. Oh yeah, quite the fall from grace. Now shut your traps before I give you two a good thrashing. Well, I'll make you a bet. If we're lying, you can thrash us all you'd like. But if I'm right, you let us walk out of here. With maybe some fresh clothes. And a bite to eat. Padwin is growing frustrated with the two's banter. I'm serious. One more word. Hey, Jacques. Seems anyone can be a soldier nowadays. Surprised they let a shrimpy silver like this onto the High Council. I'm no silver nautic scum. I'm a pridesman. Padwin seems worried, thinking over his admission. Makes sense. The intellects always get the pridesmen to do their dirty work. I do no one's bidding but my own. I chose to turn my back on those lazy pridesmen stuck in their stupid past, piling stones and hiding from the showers. Even worse, a weakling and a traitor. Padwin grabs a long hooked spear from the wall of the dungeon. He aims it at Ray through the bars. Keep up your blubbering fish man, because I'm ready for a fresh catch of criminal. 
Padwin slowly and menacingly marches towards the cell, holding the hooked spear over his shoulder. Now, gentlemen, we don't need to get violent. This really has nothing to do with any of us. No, no, it's all right, Jacques. Let the spineless traitor talk his big talk from behind these metal bars. He won't hurt us. Otherwise, he'll have to explain to his scary superior why he decided to spear his two personal prisoners. Padwin rushes towards the cell with the spear held in the air. He thrusts it between the bars at Ray, who avoids the spiked end and deftly grabs the spear. Padwin holds on to the end of the weapon as Ray takes hold and clubs Padwin in the head. Padwin falls to the ground as Ray grabs him by the legs through the bars and pulls him nearer. Instinctually, Jacques searches Padwin as best he can. He pulls a set of keys out from the unconscious man's pocket. Looks like we still got it. You mean, I still got it. Fair enough, but I got the keys. The men are laughing hysterically as Jacques unlocks them from their cell. Man, the standards have surely slipped around here. These younger generations let their passions and sensitivities cloud their judgment. Must be that spoiled Gauron effect. The two men lock Padwin inside the cell, grab the spear and race down the hallway looking for an exit. From the opposite end of the dungeon's hallway, a door swings open. High intellect Garon walks through with a few guards at his side. Oh boy, it will be something special to remember. The look these two will have when they see me. I should have brought a painter to capture this perfect moment. Oh, should we go back and get one? <laughs> Garon laughs to himself as he approaches the cell. <laughs> Garon's excitement vanishes as soon as he sees Padwin lying on the ground, locked inside the dungeon's cage. This must be a joke. Silence. I don't believe this is a joke, sir. Two escapes in a few days. What is the point of these cells if no one stays in them? Padwin is in them, sir. Exactly! Why is Padwin in the cell? Why aren't the actual prisoners in there? Idiots! Surrounded by idiots! Garon storms off as the guard makes to unlock Padwin. Leave him in there. He is a traitor after all. The group is joyfully making their way down the beautiful path. The mood is elated, and everyone is renewed with a sense of purpose and hope. Sure I'm happy to be out of that fog. I'm not a full tummy. What a blessing! Mm, our mouths are well fed. Happy we are not dead. I'm not so sure anymore. This place seems too good to be true. Maybe we did it. Maybe we actually found the garden. Duran wouldn't believe his eyes. Seemingly out of nowhere. The group makes their way to the base of a grassy hill, atop of which is a large, gorgeous tree. <laughs> ah, you finally made it. The group approaches the tree, at the trunk of which peacefully sits a figure, an entity of sorts, seemingly made of both light and shadow. Is everyone else seeing the strange, glowy light guy? I see it. Or him. Or whatever. Hmm, not sure. Something I've never seen. Almost like being in a dream. Well, is it a good dream or a bad dream? Coral does not speak, but holds the plated mirror tightly in her hands. You've made it a long way. Thank you for returning it to me. Um, I think he means the plate thingy. The entity nods and extends its hand. Coral holds the item out in front of herself, and the dish miraculously floats over to the entity. The figure holds the plated mirror in front of its luminous face. Thank you. I've been waiting a while to see all that I have created. The entity sits quietly and stares into the plated mirror. All that you've created? You mean your? Me. All four of the companions stare humbly at the entity. They are all beginning to absorb its unspeakable, all-inspiring power. There is a quiet, calm serenity surrounding the entire hill. Are you saying you created our world? Yes. And you view it all through a reflective plate? <laughs> yes. Well, I think the berries have gone to me head. <laughs> it is not a plate, but a portal. And through it, I see my work and myself. For I am in all that I make. Then you must see the death and decay in yourself. Because our world is dying. It's dying because of you. But you created it. You created us. Millions will die. A necessary purge. How could you let this happen? Because it 
is our purpose. Your purpose? You mean you'd kill all four kingdoms? I don't see four kingdoms. I see one failed realm. How would you know what a failed realm looks like? Because I have made many masterpieces, and yours is not one of them. Wait, what are you saying? There are more kingdoms out there? Realms, yes. How did we not notice? Because like many of the misguided realms, yours is only concerned with itself. So, what is your decision then? This realm must continue to suffocate, where it will lie in ashes for decades. Perhaps even centuries. Shameful you are! And to think we've come this far. The group knows what the entity means. They look to one another with worry in their eyes. Is he saying that this is it? We must go back. I have to see my parents. Our people, Coral. This thing won't help us. I agree with Bello. Let's get out of here before it's too late. No. I don't believe this thing would let millions die over the horrible deeds of a few. That is not noble or righteous. Is it more noble to allow me to continue everyone's suffering? Your suffocations are what's causing us to suffer. We are flawed, yes. But let us work at it. We can be better, collectively. Look at us. Members from different kingdoms, different paths in life, working together to lead us here. Back to you. And I thank you greatly for allowing me to see myself in your world. So you're actually going to destroy our world? Like this is really going to happen to us? No, I don't believe it. I won't give up. I don't give up on anything. Hmm, shame. If only more within this realm held the same ideals. I will not give up on our people. I will not give up on our world. I don't give up on anyone. Even if they, even if they drink too much. Even if they do get sick and can't care for themselves. Even if they do make flawed and imperfect worlds, even if they do abandon us. Coral! Durand has appeared at the base of the hill, carrying his crystal shard in front of his body. Durand! Everyone in the group stares in amazement at Durand as Coral rushes towards him. Durand's crystal floats from his fingers and is absorbed into the plated mirror before the entity. And now the fate of this world will be finalized. Before Coral could make it to Durand, the enlightened Nautic emerges from behind him, bow loaded. He fires his arrow that breezes right through the entity. The entity lifts its arm and the ground begins to shake. Durand, off balance, begins to wrestle with the Nautic. You see, flawed species in a flawed realm. Bay looks over past his sister in horror. He sees the enlightened man, the former Nautic, wrestling Durand and attempting to load another arrow from his quiver. Before anyone could react, Bay jolts towards Durand to help. The enlightened man fires another arrow, just missing Bay as he dashes in front of Durand. Fighting for his life, Durand reaches for his blade and with one powerful lunge tries to stab the enlightened Nautic. Yet once his blade pierces flesh, he notices it's another body that has fallen on top of him. Bay! Bay has been stabbed. The enlightened Nautic scurries away from them. Bello and the Enchanter sprint towards Bay. Durand attends to the fallen Bay as Coral rises to her feet. The enlightened man makes to load his bow again, but Coral is the quicker of the two. She catches the assassin by surprise and sticks him with her dagger. He falls to the ground, lifeless. Coral rushes back to Bay. This is my fault. I, I let that murderer here. I, I stabbed him. I, I did, I stabbed him. Not now, Durand. Coral pushes past Durand and kneels by her brother's side. You're going to be okay, big brother. Just don't move. Don't worry about me. This was the end anyway, right? I don't know. Maybe not. I've saved your life now. Twice. (laughs) I wonder if mom is there yet. On the other side. She is. I'm sure she is. We all will be one day. Bay's face begins to grow cold. Please don't leave me alone. Please. You're not alone. Look around you. Bay musters just enough energy to point towards Bello, Enchanter, and even Durant. They are your family now. Bay closes his eyes and slips away peacefully within the arms of his sister. Fueled with anger and sadness, she gently places her brother to the ground. Coral, I'm sorry. I- I'm sorry. This is your fault, Durand! You left us when we needed you most! 
Coral pushes Durand away, as Durand stands in shock, completely enfeebled. Coral's voice pierces through the hillside. Furious, she stares at the entity as it looks on in wonder. Is this what you wanted? Are you happy now? The remaining pride are navigating through the wandering witch-riddled market, fighting as many of the monsters as they can. Third-rate intellects and pride's people stand side by side against the supernatural force. The grotesque sounds from the demons send shockwaves through the chaotic market square. Bodwig, Fathorn, and Morin fight near one another. Maybe you guys should lead a group over the hill. I know of a passage that leads directly to my home. You and the children can be safe there until this all blows over, if it ever does. We only go if we all go together. I agree. Stronger together. Suddenly, Bodwig notices something, or someone, in the distance. Oh, yes, of course. I'll cover the rear. Morin, you get the kids from the shack. Fats, you lead everyone else to my home. Pridesman, intellects, with me. Morin rushes to collect the children. Bodwig picks up a pile of rocks that fell from the sky just days before and tosses them back toward the town. This catches the witch's attention, creating a momentary distraction. The group of humans hustle across the dead grass field under ominous skies. We're almost there. Keep moving. It's just over this hill, right, Bard? Fathorn turns back once more to look at Bodwig. He sees that Bodwig has stopped right in the middle of the open field. A female wandering witch approaches him. Fathorn, sensing Bodwig's motivation, hesitantly keeps moving and helps the human group down into the hidden pathway. Thank you, Bridesman. You saved our lives. Meanwhile, Bodwig stands face to face with a wandering witch. Hello. I can offer you whatever you need. I know I recognized you. I've missed you so much. A meal for the ages. A chest full of riches. Whatever you want, I can provide. No, this is enough. My girl. Girl? I can offer a girl. What kind? I've spent every day over the last year wondering where you went, if you were okay. I'm so sorry I wasn't there when you needed me. I failed you. I failed my family. You want a family? I can offer you a family. Bodwig yells back towards the group who is disappearing into the distance. Take care of my boy, Fats. I'm going to get my daughter back. Fathorn and Morin peer over the hilltop. So, that's what's become of his daughter. I wish... I wish... Just wish for it, and it'll come true. I wish to be with you, my daughter. Wherever it is you are. Your wish is granted. The witch's eyes ignite into fiery orbs, and her flowing robes engulf Bodwig. They both vanish into thin air. Shocked, Morn and Fathorn turn back towards the group, who are now safe from the horde of witches. Before they shut the hatch, Fathorn makes to leave again. Where do you think you're going, Fats? I need to find the rest of the Pride. Bring them back and restore our kingdom. Like heck you are. Not alone. You need to stay here and weather this mess. Keep things calm while I'm gone. I promise I will come back. I'm with all our people by my side. Morin nods his head to Fathorn and shuts the hatch behind him. Fathorn moves swiftly and determined into the distance. Garon and his guards move quickly down the hallway leading to his chambers. They turn the corner to see a few high intellects waiting. What is this about? I have not given you permission to hang around outside my personal quarters. Be gone! Garon, we have a problem. You're absolutely correct, we have a problem. Our prisoners escaped. Again. Garon, the city is... The high intellect looks worryingly towards the others. Say it already. The city is, uh, awakening. What does that mean? Sounds like nonsense to me. Sir, people are taken to the streets in a third-rate quarter, and they're, uh, apparently pretty upset. Since when was a minor riot an issue? Dispatch a borderline brigade and be done with them all. Well... Therein lies the problem, sir. Many of our soldiers have yet to report for duty this evening. Really? How many? Um, half. How can that be? Girl. 
One of Garon's butlers rushes out from behind the closed doors of his private quarters. Hi, Intellect, sir. There's something happening in the streets. Garon and the Intellects run over towards the balcony to see hundreds, if not thousands, of third- and second-rate citizens having taken to the streets. The masses below are chanting something. What are they saying? Shh! Do you think they're speaking to you, sir? Gerwa, Bordwa, all of them. They are the ones who will pay. I believe it's time we consider evacuation. From our own city? From my city? I will not hear of it. Sir, we can sneak through the fortifications underground tunnels and send men ahead with our remaining resources. And go where exactly? Run off and hide in the deserted outskirts like some filthy outlander? Great idea. We're not going anywhere. How has this happened so quickly? My plan was working perfectly. How could they accomplish this from right under our noses? Garon turns to see former high intellect Bordois standing before him. He is accompanied by Denis Dubois and his men. Bordois, you really believe this pathetic attempt of an overthrow will work? My men will be breaking down that door within seconds, and we'll have those streets cleared before you can say... Surrender. Exactly. Wait, me? I will not surrender. Denis pulls his sword slightly from his waist to reveal a blood-stained blade. No matter. More men will be on their way shortly, and if you slay me, you will all be righted before dawn. The killings, the starvation, it all stops now. Too much blood has already been shared on your watch. The cries of soldiers echo down from the end of the long hallway. Here come my men, and not a minute too soon. Gauron, this world of yours is dying, and your outdated and corrupt ideals will die with it. You don't believe all of this end of the world stuff, do you? It's nothing but panic from low-life, commonplace pedestrians. We sent Durand out just to eradicate his smug presence, to satisfy those looking for answers. But I'll tell you this, the city will prevail because I have those answers. The city will prevail even if it means we have to sacrifice some of our fellow citizens. I am doing what any great leader would do during a time of crisis. The soldiers have reached the door and begin to slam against it. The time for this charade ends now, Bordwan. They will get through, and you all will be arrested, tried, and righted. And all for nothing. Garon is suddenly confused by a sly smirk on Bordois' face. I'll wipe that confidence clear from your face. Execute them now. The soldiers force their way through the door, shattering it to the ground. Good. I said execute them now. A man amongst the crowd of soldiers begins to laugh. What is so funny? I told you to kill them all. That's an order. Gurwa, Tristan, Ray, and Jacques suddenly enter the room, smiling and laughing to themselves. Garon is frozen, a look of shock and defeat settling onto his face. You know, I used to think this city was entirely filled with egotistical vain fools like you. But having spent some time now outside this little bubble of scum that sits atop this beautiful city, I finally saw the rest of these people for who they really are. And who are they exactly, Aaron boy? Good people. Honest people. Fair people. People who can value hard work without standing on the less fortunate. People who can work together, putting aside their differences for the greater good. People who can build yet preserve our natural habitats. A fantasy. This city once stood for something righteous, and it will soon again. Garon's few remaining intellect soldiers surrender. Bordois smiles. Your reign is over, Garon, and a new era of intellects begins today. Daddy, escort this prisoner to his cell. Fine. Toss me in a cell, since they're so easy to escape from, apparently and keep four to six of your best men on guard. No need. I'll happily keep an eye on him myself. Denis makes his way towards Garon, who begins to shrivel into a ball and cry. This isn't fair! I had a perfect plan. I'm practically royalty. I don't belong rotting in a cell. Oh, don't worry. 
You won't be in a cell for long. I won't be? Nope. You'll be sent to Diamond Bay, where you'll work the rest of your days as a dock man. You hear that, Garon? We're not going to sentence you to death like you would the others. You're going to spend the rest of your life in a uniform, cleaning the hulls of our ships. The very ships you sent thousands of city and pride soldiers upon to their peril. A fitting and fair punishment for a prisoner like you. I, uh, uh, just toss me in a cell. I can't work like that forever. I'd rather sit alone and unseen in the dungeons. Garon and his guards are handcuffed and escorted out of the room. Gerwa, I have gold stored away. How much do you want? Ray, I have all the wine you can drink. Age to perfection, please. Help. Anything but hard labor, please. The soldiers drag him out of sight beyond the end of the hallway. Garon's desperate pleas soon fade away. Thank you, Gorwa. For what? For the first time in my lifetime, a war was fought and won off the strength of words, on reason. This would not be possible without you and your compassion. And Henley and the others, who gave up their lives for our chance at a change. So, what now? That reminds me. Ray, Jacques, we would like to officially extend our hand to the Nautics with the hope to reunite our great kingdoms. Ray looks to Jacques for guidance. The Nautics are humble by your offer and accept such a historic truce. Yet we will remain Nautics. Our history may be young, but it is growing and we have many great leaders ahead of us. May you consider us an ally for the rest of our days. Accepted. This is wonderful and all. What if all this was in vain? This victory here doesn't matter unless we can save our world and our environment. Bordois walks over towards the balcony and stares across the gray landscape. You're correct. This is why you will be joining us on the High Guard, effective immediately. We need more empathetic minds, like your own, on our council. Gerwa can't believe the words he just heard. You too, Tristan. You've certainly earned it. This is an honor, sir. Thank you. Thank you, high intellect. Of course. The rest is out of our control now. Let's try to reinstate some class, hmm? some dignity and respect back into the city, shall we? Everyone now stands at the edge of the balcony overlooking the city. The crowd of third and second rate citizens cheers ecstatically from below. Now, as for the great recession of our natural resources, let us hope your friend Durand is out there finding those answers for us. Along with my son and daughter. I hope they're okay. Are you happy now with all the misery you've caused? My brother's dead, and our world is dying. Is that not enough? Coral shouts menacingly at the figure as she stands over her slain brother with tears in her eyes. The entity watches over them. Why even put us here in the first place? To see us suffer? I'm not watching you suffer. I am watching you live. Then if this is to be our lives, if blood for blood is the only way back from this madness, then maybe we are too far gone. The world you're looking at is not our world. It was theirs. An older generation's failings. But that's not the world of our future. Their world is not one I want to be a part of. I believe in a better world. Then you will have the chance to prove it by improving your own. Is he saying we have another chance? The plated mirror floats freely from the entity back towards Coral's hands. She holds it in front of her face and looks on in amazement. Do you like what you see? No, I don't. Then you must change it yourselves. We will. I've grown fond of your feelings, humans. I hope this second chance for the three of you will amount to a better existence for all. Wait, the three of us? Bello notices that the plate then smoothly separates into three distinct pieces. One for Coral, Bello and the Enchanter. The pieces float before them, bright with light, and then vanishes from their sights. What about Durand? He cannot stay. I don't deserve to return. I brought shame and misery to my family, to my friends. 
A broken and conflicted man he is. Not suited for a world restored. He will be sent to one that has been suffocated. There you will have the chance to find a new purpose. Coral, Bellow, Enchanter, I will always think of you as my friends, as my real family. There's a man in the city named Gerwa. Please tell him what happened. I'm sorry. Hmm. Together we will always be, even if separately. I'll send your message to this Gerwa fellow. I hope you find some peace, Durand. Coral doesn't respond to Durand, but she stares at him deeply. Coral is about to speak as Durand disintegrates into a haze of white light. Naughty, your brother was pure of heart. We will take him with us. As for you three, home awaits. Bay's body is lifted off the ground and vanishes into a bright beam of light. Soon thereafter, Coral, Bello, and the Enchanter magically rise from the ground, all three of them holding hands, and disappear from view into a bright, luminous glow. All around the Four Kingdoms, the sun begins to peek from behind the grey clouds. The once barren water streams of the Pride begin to flow freely once again. The exotic trees that filled Enchanter begin teeming with flocks of birds, buzzing with insects. The Sea of Secrets is suddenly lush with marine life as it once was centuries ago. All has been restored to a state of serenity. The kingdoms can simultaneously breathe a sigh of relief, and the fate of the future rests in the hands of our three remaining heroes. A light flashes in the middle of a desolate city. A city with unique architecture run down by the harsh elements over time. The streets are empty and littered with debris. An explosion of supernatural energy produces a frazzled and scared Durand. He's lying on the ground where a once mighty kingdom reigned. No one has stepped foot on these lands in over a century. A former world with multiple kingdoms and millions of citizens is now dust. A defeated Durand catches his breath and gathers some strength to rise to his feet. Where am I? A new beginning. The end.